who's sitting patiently here, smiling. Uh, I met Julia last year at University of Minnesota. She's a professor of architecture there. Uh, she has a master's of anthropology as well as a bachelor's of architecture. Um, and uh, she and I both have done our PhD at uh, Del Technical University in the Netherlands. So we both spent time in Holland and we're very interested in, in Dutch housing. Um, and she has taken students to the Netherlands on a number of occasions, which is something that I look forward to doing here as well, looking at uh, innovative housing solutions in the Netherlands. Um, she hosted a symposium that was dealing with innovative Dutch housing solutions, and this is the work that she's presenting here and will be on exhibit. She's, done, uh, she's written or co-authored three books. The first co-authored book with um, Andrzej Piotrowski, Andrzej Piotrowski uh, on the discipline of architecture, uh, and then a book on institution and home, architecture as a cultural medium, and her latest book, Complex Housing, Designing for Density. Um, we're very happy to welcome Julia here. Uh, in addition to Julia, we have, um, sitting quietly in the front rows here, James Spiller, who many of you may or may not know. He taught for many years here at the College of Design, and currently he's the Director of Design at Blackbird Investments, which is a <coughs> real estate company, but is doing some interesting innovative housing solutions. So I thought it would be good to have James reacting to some of Julia's work. And then rather than having you guys ask questions, we'll try to launch a bit of a discussion here for you to react to and continue the conversation during the exhibit. The other person that I'm happy to welcome is Daniel Coleman. Daniel um, is new to our college. He joined us last fall in the, uh, in the community and regional planning, but he also has a joint appointment with the College of Business where you are teaching in real estate development. And so, uh, you know, also bringing that understanding of what are ways in which plan and real estate development go together to make things happen or not happen in particular ways. Um, he has a master's in city and regional planning and completed your PhD at Cornell just recently, I believe. Congratulations, completed your PhD. Awesome. Uh, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> okay, um, I probably missed a few things because I do feel rushed, but whatever I've missed, I'll remind myself of the announce the exhibition hall. Thank you for coming for a great turnout. And Julia, I will advance slides for you. If you like, we'll switch over now. Turn your mic on and get to the interesting part. <coughs> I'm very bad with technology, so this will be and have bad luck. <coughs> we'll get through this. <laughs> get through this, I'm sure. Get through this. down. Find out. Uh, with the idea of trying to understand how to put the conditions 
have a life to replicate this. I just ate some dust. <laughs> it is a dusty room. I bet you can just have some of the salty uh, tropias. No, I didn't buy it. The tropias I found, by the way, are in the shape of canal passes. <laughs> okay, so the background. So the next slide, please. Um, so the Netherlands, I don't know, I suppose all of you know where it is in the, in the northern part of the main continent of um, just below Scandinavia, between Belgium and Germany, and opposite the, Chine the, the channel from um, UK. Um, next slide. Oh, I know, question. What do you think? So I'm going to ask you, you to say, oh, when you think of the Netherlands, what comes to mind? William of Orange. William of Orange, okay, what else? Legos. Legos. Canals. Tulips. Okay. So, so we have windmills. We have canals, like you said. We don't have William of Orange, although we have the tulips, which are orange, so that's something. Um, and then bicycling, which people say. And, and why is that? So next slide. <coughs> because the Netherlands is a delta. It's a delta of three rivers the shelf of Meuse and the Rhine, and in the Middle Ages, it was a very hot, a very important commercial center because um, these rivers all, I mean, I don't know, what is the matter with this? What is that? It's water. <laughs> in the Netherlands, it was the place where people transported all their goods because they were in the ship around the world. And, um, in the Middle Ages, you didn't have roads. There was a water by which you transported your goods. So that was a very, very important place. And there was a period in which they were the, had just an extremely wealthy country, huge roads with gold or everywhere. And so today, even today, they're, they're a banking center, market center. They have Rotterdam, which is the, one of the largest um, harbors in the world. And so it's still a very important um, trading center and um, center for uh, commerce and um, finance in the world. So it's because of its central position in Europe, its position is a delta below sea level. And so that's one of the reasons that um, we think about canals and windmills, because in the Middle Ages, the um, technology to pump water was windmills. So we have to think about how you're going to pump the water out here below sea level. You have to keep pumping the water. <laughs> um, position is one of the most dense countries in the world because of its wealth. People have moved there also because of its tolerance over the years. Um, its political tolerance, people have moved from all different places and moved there to live in different periods of um, the <laughs> So um, it, it, it's a, it has a lot of things going for it. So that's why the thing in particular that. And oh, I forgot to mention the cloths, uh, <coughs> and that's because. When, you're, um, when you go out into the fields, it's wet, and so you don't want to wear leather shoes, you wear clogs, and then you wear your leather shoes in the house. So, this, so one of the things that happened in the Netherlands was that they drained um, land from the sea. And I always wondered why and how they could do that, and I found these images, which I think really explain how you could create land from watery places by draining, because the, 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 it, it's very, very sl slow slope. So if you drain the water out, you can create dry land. And so that um, explains that. And that also explains why my late husband, Richard Stoltzenberg, said, since the Middle Ages, the, the Dutch have been pumping day and night. <laughs> because you can't stop. And all, another thing about that is that if you pump, and your, but, and, but your neighbor doesn't pump, it may not be enough. So one of the things about the Netherlands is people have to talk to each other. And this has created a country where people talk about a lot of things. Also, it's why they have excellent planning. Because if they don't plan, they could be. Why don't we take the next slide? Um, this is the Netherlands on the left, <coughs> pumping. On the right, if they didn't pump, this is what the Netherlands would look like. And of course, with rising seas, it could even be worse. So they're constantly pumping and talking and um, making sure that they could plan so that they can have a future still Above water. <coughs> a reminder of windmills. And the density um, is, is a really important part of it because that's why we have dense housing there. They're, they're living cheek to jowl and they develop every bit of land very carefully from the, from the point of view of both density and water. 
And this just shows you um, on the east part of the country, it's less dense. It's on the west side where we're going to be looking at the project. So if you see in the little map on the left, the next location of the projects that I'm going to be all well, in the book. I don't know who you're talking about on that map, but anyway, let's go on to the next. Um, and one more important thing is that um, the Netherlands has a very, I want to make sure I got this right, a low, a low Gini score. The Gini score is, is a measure of the, di the difference between the rich and the poor in a particular country. So whereas in the United States we have a relatively high one, we're only fifth out of 104, the top third, we could be a little above, we could be a lot better. The Netherlands is, um, is 20, uh, I think they're fifth, the fifth lowest in the world. So they have a very small difference between the rich and the poor in that, you'll, you'll see why that's important. Another important thing, historically, this is a, an image that was made by Henry Berlaga um, because he was a very important planner in the Netherlands. He took a lot of ideas from Camilo Cite from Spain. And um, he um, was very interested in making sure that the city was well designed, but also there at that time, in the 19th century, there was a huge industrial revolution that we all know about, and the city of Amsterdam was very, very um, highly densely populated. And so in the late um, 19th century, um, they, the developers started to build housing for people in the next ring. And um, it turned out that the housing for the low-income people was really terrible. And the government was, just thought it was totally unsatisfactory. And they decided that they had to um, shift the resources from the private section for the low-income. And the government decided to take over the design and building of low-income housing. At that time, there were what was called three pillars in the, in the Netherlands. One was the Catholics, one was the Protestants, and one was the others who weren't Catholic or Protestants. Socialists, Jews, a lot of different people. Um, and um, so they gave money to each of these groups to my, my uh, late husband Richard was a socialist. He would send, I am doing actually. But he would say, um, to man emancipate the workers. Um, so that was the purpose of this housing, was to emancipate the workers. And the idea was to give them not just housing. So these housing corporations didn't just build housing, they built neighborhoods. They built um, bath houses, they built laundry facilities, they built libraries, they built schools. They built commercial, each neighborhood had its own areas that were built like this. And this set of put it was a pattern for the way that, that the Dutch plan, where they don't just put housing in any place. They, it's called, um, they, they see housing as part of the urban fabric. And so they design a neighborhood that you put housing in, and then housing them as a piece of a larger. And that's really important. Thinking of housing as an urban fabric, I think, is a very important principle that creates the housing that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and then in 1901, um, um, the, there was a housing act which, which then prescribed um, a series of codes and regulations. It prescribed that architects actually be involved in both the planning of the city and in the planning of, of, um, of the um, of architect, of building, and so that architects do have a certain status in the, in the Netherlands as designers. And then the other thing was that that was also that you had to have then a plan um, for the city. So they required that every city have a plan. So that was another piece of that. I think we've covered that. Thanks. So the top, the period of housing I'm going to talk about is the Phoenix period. I know it looks like Binax, but I thought you'd say Phoenix. Um, and it's between 1995 and 2000. This housing actually goes into 2010 because it was planned during this period, but some of it was built later. And um, that time, for the, for the first part of the Phoenix period, the government, um, there were three levels of government that had their own plans. So you had the federal government that did research to discover, fancy this, to where housing was needed, what type of housing was needed, and then the government would say, well, we're going to put this type of housing here and that type of housing there because that's where the need is, or well, that's where we want to go, which wasn't always successful, why it's not always accomplished today. Um, they designated the locality and they identified the types, target groups, and densities that should be built. To be built. Then there was a, there's a regional government and they did the infrastructure. That that's the water systems, the green space, the transportation systems. And then the local plan, local municipal 
government then develop a specific site and um, made a general urban design as required and then selected the developers to and have some associations that they would work with and then they would hire the design the architects and designers. And usually there were several designers that several architects hired to do a particular project and they would work together with the developer looking at their uh, plan done by their, their municipality and then they would negotiate with the municipality if it didn't work out. So there's always this idea of discussion. So you don't just take a plan, but you actually look at it and you think about how you would, would actually actualize it and then you discuss and maybe re renegotiate it. Um, so this is talking about, I'm going to, it's a challenge to talk about the slide. This slide talks about how much rental housing exists. And you can see um, we have social housing, which is rental housing, and then private rental, and then owner occupied is blue. So what you see here is that the owner occupied housing was only 30% in 1947, but today it's 2010, or the 2010 it's on 60%. So you can see that then, like it's the reversal in the last number of years, 50 years, it's totally changed. So at the time, um, in the 40s, was a lot of most people rented. And today, then, most people own. And that's been a very important change in the society. And let's see, let's see, about 1990, you could see that suddenly there's a growth in the ownership. And the reason is because at that time, the government was, um, that it was a recession. And the government saw that the housing corporations, which had built rental housing, and they built it very well, and they had continued to build it, and when they made they, they profit, they built more, they had this wonderful portfolio of housing, and the government said, well, I guess we don't have to fund the housing anymore. If we allow the um, housing corporations to sell some of their housing, then, we, then um, they could finance more housing. So that was, they changed then from, from a government-led system to a market-based system. And that had a lot of ramifications, and there's, there's been some struggles, but I won't get into that. But in any event, um, what I wanted to um, say, I've been out of my mind. So let's go on to the next slide. <laughs> Um, housing starts, and then similar to the United States, um, and all over the world, in 2008 there was a terrible recession, and so what's happened now in the Netherlands, and the, they were, they, all the housing was basically, nothing was built except things that were already planned for, for a number of years, and the architects all lost their jobs, and it's a terrible situation where um, there's just a very small number of architects now that still have practices, but they are getting business, in it, so it's, um, it's been kind of Great tragedy. So these are the projects, the eight projects. And um, just uh, what is it even twice? I want to see my density. I'm going to talk about, oh, I wanted to also mention my research assistants who helped me with the book and did all these illustrations for me. Um, over the years, I've had a top 30, and it's been very exciting. To, it's one of the joys, actually, of the book was working with all my research. So what is complex housing? Complex housing is large, relatively dense housing project, usually on a block, urban block. So it's not um, it's not conceived of as a particular um, building, but as a block, as a, as a grouping of housing. Units for both rental and purchase. I know what I was going to say was that when the um, housing corporations were allowed to sell some of their units, then there was a question of how how do we manage these? We have rent, rental and purchase units in the same same organization, and what the government developed, of course, is a owner's organization that would have give the um, housing corporation uh, control over the, the rental units, and the owners individually have control, so proportional control over the maintenance and all those other things that happen. So you have, typically, as in here, like all owners, you have a, a, what we call condo fee, and then that's going into the maintenance, uh, and then they share the, share the decisions. And of course, the, the uh, housing corporation maintains the majority control, so they're in the majority. But they, they do listen because they have this cultural discussion, so there's always an opportunity to find your way in. Um, so then the third thing here is they serve this wonderful mix of low income, middle income, and upper income people. And at first, it was social housing, it was Phoenix in the period, but then when they started selling it, it was social housing any more for social housing. Well, some of it's social housing, but a lot of it ended up being sold as um, middle income or even lower income housing sold as 
three or more housing types. Now this is what, I, what was especially interesting to me and why I got interested in this book altogether was because they didn't just, in the United States, often when we're doing dense housing, either we take row housing and we just build it off the wazoo, or we take um, double loaded corridor buildings and we place them on the site until you get the density you want. And in the Netherlands, in these buildings, there's all different types of housing that are stacked in different ways and set side by side. And so that becomes a very, it makes a, for an art it makes a sculptural design as well as a really interesting way of living. So uh, that is what got me interested in these housing. And along with that goes these diverse organizational strategies, which we'll talk about. So how you get your unit um, can be through a corridor, a single loader corridor, where you have a, just a hall on one side that's usually open to the outdoors, or it can be double loaded like we have here. Um, you have skip stop with units like for Design with a um, big corridor, their level. Or whatever, how many you want to have to decide. And then um, vestibule access is a term I developed for apartments where you have a, um, an elevator core with apartments just around it, and so the vestibule access apartments. And then, um, oh, I think I talked about all of them. Okay. And then the height. Usually in the Netherlands, buildings aren't as tall as in other countries, partly because of the, of the land in the, on the delta, a little bit less, more difficult. But partly just because of the culture, they really don't like all And um, so most of these buildings are six, maybe eight stories at the, from the blocks, and then sometimes they're towers. They go along with that. Well, it says 12, actually, I think one of them is 20. Um, and then typically, there's non housing uses, so we have a mixed use project, and there are a variety of uses that we'll talk about. And then because of the scale, they're an urban landmark. So they're, they're, they're very prominent. So if you design one of these and it doesn't go well, your reputation could be damaged. So that means that I think that the developers um, put a lot of attention into how these are designed. So when I looked at these projects, my approach was a typological approach. And um, what I, how many of you are familiar with the ty term typology? Um, how many of you are not familiar? Okay, I better explain a little bit. So typology is a way of looking at something where you classify it in terms of the, in terms of the way things are, um, are designed. So you could look at, in this particular case, these are some of the typology I've looked at. You could look at massing types. <coughs> you could look at housing types. So we talked about different housing types. Um, uh, among, among these that's not represented here, actually I forgot to put on the slide, is, is a group home. So they mix different types of housing, also housing for the elderly as part as it could be seen as a different housing type. But here we have um, the skip stop, you know, does Maisonette, the, um, the um, Maisonette, I can't read it, but they're different ones. And then we have the 45 minutes. Okay, and then access, we talked about that. And then outdoor space, I didn't talk about, but that's one thing that I think really is significant about the difference between the way we do things in the States and the way we do things in the Netherlands is that they really, they don't have a lot of sun. So when they have sun, they want to go outdoors and they don't want to have just a little look out the window. So they develop a balcony or a loggia or a root garden or garden or something that's big enough that she could actually sit outside and have a meal outdoors. So that's really important. And then um, a loggia, I'll just tell you, because you probably don't know what a loggia is. A loggia is a type of balcony except it's within the envelope of the building. And usually they're glass, glass along the edges, and usually it's placed in a very windy place or a place where there's a lot of noise, like a train track. There are a lot of trains in that one. And um, so you can close off the space and sit inside, either with the windows open. Okay, so here are the five examples shown chronologically. And these are some things to look at, especially for a student. Um, siding on the urban block. So think about what are the street setbacks, what are the courtyards, how tall are the buildings, what's the number of units, um, how dense are they. Um, and here we're talking about units, I have units per acre and units per hectare. Um, I don't want to go into that, but if you want to know more about density, you can read it in my book. Um, variety of unit access, variety of dwelling types, and then how a courtyard is used, and what are the non housing functions. So the Musen, the Musen is about a quarter of a mile long. The next slide. You can see it here on the edge of this park. And this is built in Almira, which is one of the polder cities. 
And a colder is some of this land that's been reclaimed from the sea. In this case, it's the, the South Sea, South the other sea. Um, and they, they claim huge areas of, of land from the sea, the South Sea. And that was in the 50s. And then they, because they thought they needed agricultural land, it was important that you can use was there, and they find so, so much agricultural work. But um, let's see. So, the, the city then was, was started in the 50s and, in the, and, and then the, no, the land was reclaimed in the 50s and in the 60s they started building the cities and today this has a, a population of 250,000. So you could see how much building was going on and this was built in the 90s. So and then most of this area was, was already built. So this was the, there was a competition to build the house, to build the project and they, um, the, pe the people of the competition talked to the neighbors and originally it was to be like the back. So you see, can see the parking lot, which is the remnant of the original design. And the architects, when talking with their neighbors, discovered that they were very afraid of the density that would be right close to their unit. So they made it very flat and along the, so much less curved and along the edge. And maybe, uh, a little bit. You can see here that the building has, um, is longer than and most of the units then face the park. It's a single loaded corridor or on the top and then um, a row house on the bottom. The other thing that the residents said is they didn't think anybody should be sleeping on the ground floor, so they decided to put row housing all over the, the, um, the project so that nobody had to sleep on the ground floor. And then in the middle is an interior atrium, and then on the on the top of that on the um, is all on um, so there's flats, row house on the bottom, flats, and then on the top are tent houses. And then on this side, there are these tulip units, which have maisonettes and flats. And then in the middle is this atrium. So a folder city, and this is in the suburbs. Um, community participation talk was designed, it's really originally designed for the elderly, but when they went to sell it, um, it turned out that there was a lot of housing for the elderly on the market. So they sold it to a majority of wide range of people, but they, none of them, without you, that's one of the and originally included social housing, but because of the change, and also because it, it was a competition, and they felt they had to build it like the which it was rather expensive, so they ended up selling um, more than this than, than they intended. Um, this frames this music park, and the interior courtyard, and then the adjacent parking you saw is all the park. And here is this design, as I told you, and then you can see the section of this interior atrium. You can see the penthouse on top and the flats, Lower level, and then one of the things that's interesting, um, if we go back, you can see that the um, that the row houses are one bay, the flats are two bays, and the tent houses are three bays, and then with the flats they flip, sometimes flip the plan. So you get this really interesting pattern of balconies, and then the setback on the top, which creates a really interesting function of scale, vertical scale. And so this is just an image of the you can see with the single open corridors on either side of the open corridor. And then this is the, um, I, I, I thought it would be really interesting and revealing to add, do the gamma um, syntax diagram, so that's how I'm going to show this. So we started to have more. Um, so I, I, I'll just show, just say basically, I won't go into detail, but you can see that the row houses are either on the, 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 the Exterior is at the bottom of the image, and every, uh, gamma gap analysis shows you is what's connected to what. So the exterior is connected to the entrances of all of the rooms on, of the row houses on the outside, and then you walk one step. There's another set of row houses that are on the interior of the courtyard, so that's what's shown there. And then these two um, vertical um, axes then show how there are two elevator cores, and then some of the units connect to both cores, and some of the units just connect to Uh, is this familiar to anybody? Uh, okay, this is a very well-known project by NBRDB Architects. <coughs> this was um, designed to represent the, um, the container building, the container ships that, that actually displaced the uh, shipping from the, the riversides in so many of the countries in Europe. And when the container ships came, they were very, had very deep Draft. Draft. Yeah. They're deep draft, and um, they so they couldn't go up the river the way formerly the ships had gone up the river, and then 
we had all those warehouses and stuff along the river. But when the container ships came, then the, all of the shipping ended up being shipped by truck or by train or whatever from the harbors. And so then this land was freed up in a lot of rivers. And so in Amsterdam, especially, they developed all this land. And this land, well, this was a project that was a, they had developed the east dock lines, and this was the first project of the west dock lines. And one of the advantages that the architects had was that it is in the water, and it has views in every single direction. And so they took advantage of this to, to, to do some experimenting, and they developed um, every, every different color, I think it represents a different housing type. And so they they represent these housing types like you would on the container ship with these different uh, colors of materials and demonstration. And so they um, did this experimental design. Um, so we have here then. Uh, so Julie, do the boats go right up to the dwellings? They, because in this case, so there's a dock underneath, but the, but they only only the, not everybody owns a boat, <laughs> so it's a, it's a small dock. Um, <coughs> So we have the six, all of these the different, by 50 different types of housing units because of this experimental design. And then um, for Salem and all the different things you'd expect. Uh, well, one thing is the parking, they, the parking they had to develop an automatic parking because there wasn't much space, so they had a dock, a long thin dock. And so the, there was no room to have people actually driving their cars, and so they developed this automatic um, parking system. This is a set of gallery access flats of single loaded corridors. And this group of housing was a um, cooperative that had been in, uh, squatting on the site, and they, they agreed to work with the architects. Um, and they had a certain piece of that project designated. And this is just the overall design. You can see then this, the idea of um, these different the three elevator cores and then four blocks of housing that linked. And then you see that they different housing um, types, where it means that there's not always a corridor on every single level, because if you have a maisonette, you don't have to have a corridor. So you can see that each level had to be very carefully designed. Another aspect of this was the architect's design, so that once you got into the building, you could connect to all the different parts of the building. So it's very much a social group. They wanted it to be feel like a neighborhood. And then um, the one thing the city required was that there be some public space on the, on the river. And the purple thing that goes under the building is, is a deck that they built that you and I can go and see. You just have to go, go up and then you go under the building and you can go up there. So here's some of the images of all these different types of access. And I won't go to the screen to see the next slide. And then this is the uh, this is the automatic parking. You go in there, you put your, your car in, you get out of your car, and you, then the car is taken in here and parked. And I don't know what you do with you. Um, and then if you go, oh, one more thing. Uh, this is the deck on um, the lower right, and then this is some, some more of these um, single of the carters or the main part of, this, of the photograph, and then you can see other transitions. And then this is the diagram for this building, and you can see how these three elevator cores are connected with these corridors and different on different levels, and you can see how each level is on different different um, units and so on. And this is Freiburg. Freiburg is a project that's uh, cooperative housing and um, built by a very well-known architect in the Netherlands named Heinde Hahn. And he developed a number of uh, cooperative housing projects. It has a very interesting history if you want to read about it in the book. But he basically started out doing squatter housing and ended up doing um, cooperative housing. And um, this is it's designed around the courtyard. And then it's built as a green project. And it was a participatory project. He worked, he needed some access over his neighbors where he lived, said, let's let's do a project for ourselves. And they actually funded it with their own private funding money. And then they worked with a housing corporation later. And the housing corporation helped, they did the housing. And the housing corporation um, didn't work on the housing so much. They were the ones who contributed the other activities, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it was on a site in the river that was developed as an island that was built, further built up um, to, to create housing. And he advertised for co-op participants. And they actually participated in siting the building of the original um, participants. And here are some of the different types of housing, um, especially live work units, because a lot of these people were artists and wanted to have live work opportunities. And these, these units all have access to the street. 
as well as exits from the social um, second, what we would call the second floor or the first floor. There's a deck that goes on the points. You can see on the slide, it's one thing that goes all the way around. There's a deck and there's a courtyard, and then you can see it's very complicated how it's uh, connected around the bridge. And then it also has, working with this housing corporation, they have a um, group home there. One of the original participants had, had a child who was, they were having trouble, an adult child, young adult, who had trouble getting housing for being schizophrenic. And um, so they built a group home for that person and then other people, of course, as well. And then there's um, theater seven and six is the, six is, oh, the seven is the cafe, six is the theater, three is the greenhouse where we've been, um, the teens, teens met, and then all these different kinds of places. And this diagram is the most complex. Um, and you can see it's very highly connected because of its social origins and everybody really wants to It was designed for everybody to get to know each other. And then a lot of variety of housing types of that. And this is Silver Club. Um, Silver Club was um, designed by Lucien Kroll, who was a um, well-known architect in the 60s. And he was invited, he's a participatory design architect, and was invited by the housing corporation because this is in a 25-acre area that was all low-income housing built in the 70s, 60s. And so by the 80s, <coughs> you imagine that there were some units that were um, in trouble, and they, they felt that they, they had to do something about it. They were losing money, so they hired Kroll to come, and um, he, he worked with them on urban design that um, involved a lot of different things, building schools and making a whole area, not just low income, but introducing how to reduce um, upper middle income people to this area. And this project was sort of the center. Um, it was They didn't have commercial, so this is built as the commercial center of housing above. And it's got two courtyards. You can see the upper right is a commercial courtyard and the green is the residence courtyard. It's all the lowest level is all commercial. And then the, so the commercial courtyard is on the ground level and then the housing courtyard is over the commercial. And then the parking is on the whole place, so underground parking is commercial for all the um, And then the variety of housing types, the skip stop, for example, form the bridge over the entry into the and then you can see all the different types of um, exterior space. Kroll was known for um, the anti-radical thinker and wanted every unit to be different. And he actually made this to be for him. So it's kind of an amazing uh, design. Um, so one of the buildings, eight buildings, one of them is a tower, it's a tower, and then it's a um, single of some masonettes, I'm not masonettes. Row houses in the middle of the courtyard on the, on the lower slide, and then the lobby. And then this building, actually, although it looks very radical, is actually very traditional in its structural organization. You have there are eight, there's yeah, supposedly seven buildings, but there are actually five elevator floors. And you can see in the, 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 the very lowest level, none of the housing gets is at, at a three <coughs> on the ground level. It's all that's all commercial on that level, and then the housing's all. And the Grand Cour is, if any of you've been to Amsterdam, you may have seen this building because it's very recognizable. Um, it's right near the airport station. And, it, and what we see here is actually an accident. Let me go to the next slide. Um, the original building was supposed to be like this bottom slide. I actually reconstructed the photograph to show what it looked like. Um, and what happened was that the we talked about negotiation between the city and the developer. Well, the developer was given this plan by the city, and so you had so many units, and then the architects started to clip the units, and they said, well, you know, it doesn't fit. We can't get that many units. And the city said, well, we're not going to allow you to just build another three levels. You have to figure out a way of doing this that's not going to shade the street and the courtyard. So, yeah, it was designed to shade the So they developed this idea of the um, periscope with on the right here, you can see there's a very narrow vertical piece, which has either only one or two units per level, and then you have this piece that, that um, let's say, what's it Cantilever, right? And the cantilevering over the rest of the project so that it doesn't, um, so it's high, but it isn't wide. So that logic to get this. 
So three courtyards, I think we can next slide. Three courtyards and three architects. You can see here then there's a this this there's a big wall on the building on the north side. East by east side is this block of of um, skip stop units in the middle and then vestibule apartments on two ends and then row houses forming the inside one side of the courtyards and then there are these vestibule towers connected by the bridges and then on the north side are these gallery or single open corridors and then the airport. And so here are the three courtyards by the three different architects in the courtyard too they have a um, slope so there's canal in the lower um, lower part of the right and then the left is the main street where there's a lot of and then the data diagram in this building, they do connect a lot of the units, a lot of the sections, so it's all stuff that's, because of the wide variety of units and the uh, different types of connections, because of the pairs of buildings and having that access on two ends, it's quite complicated. As you can see here, it gives you some sense of the complexity of it. It has these cities, elevator forms, and then they're, they're not uniform, they're very diverse, and then they so here's the three other examples we have time. Maybe we'll skip this part. Um, maybe just read that. Go back one just briefly. Arvisa Lan is a traditional design, um, and the Bay one is a new urbanist design, and the old plan is a design where the ch church wanted to need to need it to develop some land, and they worked with the city to create um, a new building, very down near the church, and put a building for church underneath. So what are the conclusions? So the design principles, um, housing is an urban fabric. We talked about that. You can see the quite variety of urban fabric and how housing fits in. Um, Multi-use additional functions. So we have the cafe, you remember this is a church. And then on this um, Carnese line, which we didn't talk about, has a clinic and a library. And the Alpine, which we didn't talk about, has an um, interior courtyard that serves as a play space. And then um, in the private, which is the cooperative housing, is wonderful. Bicycle parking, and then this is the commercial level. Variety of courtyards, as we talked about that just now. Um, so we have, yeah, this variety of courtyards. What's the last one? Variety of functions. Okay, so Captain, and this is variety of courtyards. So we have a visual courtyard on the upper left, parking courtyard from the, the new urbanist design. This is the interior courtyard, the commercial courtyard from the little court, and then this is play courtyard. And then a variety of articulation. You can see all the different kinds of um, cantilevers and balconies and materials and just a lot of rich uh, ideas. And one of the things I think that's very important is these projects don't look When we do dense housing in this country, it tends to all be simple. A lot of this not um, And the variety of development. So here we have on the upper right row houses beneath with um, apartments. <coughs> this is the skip stop units. For, and then on the right is live work. Some of these are exactly also also the income and that are these a lot of projects. Are, the, are the different incomes tied to certain types or every type does Oh, oh I have a diagram. So this is just a diagram that shows some of the different types of arrangements because they do have everything. On some of them, were, the more traditional one is organized like the one on the left where you have actually each on this one block, each um, each of the projects was originally designed to have one type, although it turned out because they sold them that there's a mix of low income and middle income in some of them. And so it ends up being quite fair. It's more variety than it looks like. Um, this next one you have is the idea of um, having only um, one level difference. So in some units you have upper and middle, other units, other buildings have middle and lower. So that, that makes much less of a range, and then the one on the lower right, lower left, is um, more like um, the, the Cecilo John, where you have a certain housing type in a certain part of the building, and that all those people are alike, and then you have another part of the building, you have another type. So they have on the corridor is the way it's organized. So on one corridor, you have one type, one level, and another part you might have level. And then, of course, if you like the, um, the, the silver floor project, it's <coughs> mixed. Um, you have penthouses that are all on the top that are going through on the outside, sharing the elevator floor with those that come out on the middle of And then access types, variety of access types, so single of the carter, just to give you 
on the left is on Zumaflot, on the right is Freiburg, and then on the upper right is Silodon, and then um, so you can do a double of the garden, which is a joy. And then a variety of outdoor space in here, you can see bits of roof, rooftop garden up on the left from Silverflow, and then the party salon, they didn't provide balconies because there was a change in the law for a few years when they actually built this project. So these people had to use the, the single over corridor as their outdoor space, which was fun. They weren't very happy about it. Um, so decks, uh, and then on the right is a loggia, so you can have a picture of a loggia, which has these uh, windows, on, sometimes on two sides, sometimes on one side of these. In some cases, you can actually do a window slide. This is just um, psychological analysis, all the plans at the same scale, slide. This is all the different space impact analysis diagrams. Um, so two of the, these two are um, the ones that have um, <laughs> There's buildings with access on the um, two corners, and they have um, galleries all around for the most part. Then row houses, and mixed houses, and row houses, and several different kinds of parking. On the next slide, these units have a traditional organization where you have an elevator floor with similar buildings coming from similar flats, and, and then the last ones, of course, is more complex ones where they're interconnected. Applications for design, we're just ending here. Um, special circumstances that led to this um, do not have to be replicated. That's what this slide is basically about. But there are some factors. And so these are some of the factors are this idea of housing as an urban fabric because you, you really need to have that thing integrated to, to make it a successful complex housing project. The site encompasses a part of the larger neighborhood designers. The, the city should have urban designers that make these plans. So there has to be some kind of control by the government of the designer, otherwise it's not going to be compromised. People will it doesn't always make the kind of profit that people would want to make social profit, not monetary profit. Um, it's more likely to work on a prominent site in an open space with a courtyard, more likely to be built in response to building codes that stress the importance of look and look, light and air. That's the Dutch, I think the Dutch could do it in a more poetic way. Um, outdoor space for old dwellings and building closer onto the lot line. Um, when laws and regulation institutions encourage mixed income, so the law required them to mix the income. This wasn't something that people did voluntarily. Um, mixed sales and rental, finance, financing cooperative housing, community amenities like the private, so that these housing corporations were charged not just to do housing, but to do other kinds of things. So that's how they could afford to do it. Of course, they're very rich, so they can do it. Um, it's very more likely to be accepted when future inhabitants are involved in the planning. The number of residents that share an entry corridor or a courtyard is small enough for people to recognize each other. Why don't we have more of this in Canada or in the U.S. 
USA. And is it because we aren't as creative as these Dutch designers? Or is it because there's something happening in the regulatory environment, or the financing environment? And I think trying to understand that is something that, um, yeah. I'm curious about uh, um, what we could change. All of the above. I, I, all right, so just some context, I work in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, our, the footprint of our organization reaches beyond the state of Iowa. Uh, but I think talking about it in the context of Iowa helps um, contrast, keep it simpler. Um, so all of the above. Uh, regulatory, certainly. The idea of light and air as a required focus, that is not uh, what the International Building Code has applied within the state of Iowa is looking for. Local jurisdictions care about health, safety, and welfare. Uh, that's a very, that's a, a litigious term, right? This is about uh, litigation. It's not about health and happiness, uh, right? It's about uh, health, safety, and welfare. So that's one, regulatory. Uh, the second you mentioned is finance. Uh, so the way projects are financed. So think about the general sort of uh, state of capitalism in the United States. The faster a project can be executed, the faster it can get to market, the more developers, the more money developers will make. Uh, therefore, fast, easy, cheap, simple, uh, typically wins the day within capitalism. It's, a, right, it's, it's laughable in many ways, but if you just want to talk about the context and conditions. Um, the other ones you stated were governmental or, or regulatory, kind of beyond, uh, beyond the building regulations. The context for decision making, we also have federal regulations, we have regional plans, <coughs> comprehensive plans, local plans, sub-area plans, and this is your world, um, but as developers, we touch those plans. Those are intended to sort of maintain ideas and identities uh, for projects as they move forward, but when those collide with sort of the, the motives of capitalism, we have simplifications that uh, typically water down answers that could be much more fluid. The other thing I wanted to identify, and this has to do with contrasting, is the regulatory environment. The idea that a law would require mixed incomes is very fascinating. And that the law in the Netherlands would require that has generated answers which must solve that. But in the United States, it's the exact opposite. The law does not encourage that. So if you look at low-income housing, and let's again use Iowa, the low-income housing tax credit is the mechanism which typically funds low-income housing. That's a legal phrase. So when we talk about affordability or mixed incomes, the laws distribute funds to developers and developments um, according to a, a, a sort of method of equity. And what I mean by that is everybody must apply um, for a project in an area uh, to utilize this low-income housing tax credit, and those projects are submitted to the state, the Iowa Finance Authority. This is all very boring, but it's very important. They apply, it's reviewed under what's called a QAP, which means that they check it for points. You get points if you hit certain check boxes. So the, the scoring system dictates what types of buildings win. So it is a, comp a competitive process, but it's not competitive by architects. It's competitive by point systems. And so what is in those point systems very much dictates what type of projects will get built. My point is, is that the laws which dictate how funds go and support low-income, mixed-income, high-income housing very much contradicts what we're seeing up here. It is, it is the antithesis of mixing people. Uh, it is the opposite. It's in fact, think about it like this. The United States government, or um, in this case, the Iowa government, wants to make sure that the money is being used as effectively as possible to help the most amount of people get housing. That's the intent. It's not about necessarily uh, how they get housing. It's not even how the, sort of the structure or design or space of that housing supports them. It's about health, safety, and welfare of that housing. So my comment would be in contradiction to this, the laws very much present a system where uh, an economic answer emerges, and a spatial answer emerges, and a design answer emerges, uh, which, again, coming back, it makes our designers look pragmatic. That's the best I can do. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have much to add. That's a very <laughs> comprehensive response. Um, I think one of the things that struck me as a, as a planner and as someone who thinks about housing policy, you know, as James does, is if you saw, I mean, one of the first charts you showed where it had kind of breakdown, 
the tenure in the Dutch context where you have it's like 20% in social housing. Um, that's pretty remarkable. That's a remarkably higher level of kind of people receiving housing subsidies, or kind of, kind of low-income housing subsidies, I should say, in the US. I think that by most calculations, about one in four kind of low-income families who qualify for it, or who would qualify for a housing subsidy in the US receive it. Um, so I think if you just start at a level in which you have a much larger kind of population, a much larger um, kind of uh, a component of the low-income population who's eligible for subsidies and are going to receive them, it allows for more innovation in that space too, right? Um, again, I think your, your description of how LIHTC works and it's true for, for Section 8 or, or the Housing Choice Voucher as well, um, it's limited resources and there's a lot of competition. And so these kind of organizations are trying to do the most that they can, they can with limited resources. Um, and I think when you have a little bit more space to work, you see kind of interesting and, and kind of um, unique results as a, as a response. Well, one of the other thoughts I would add on top of this is the idea of mixed sales and rental in a single property or a single location. This comes back to how projects are financed. And again, the lending institutions in the United States are different than the lending institutions and regulatory bodies of the Netherlands. And so to be clear, the lending institutions in the United States are very uncomfortable with <coughs> complex deals. Right? So the more complex the financial deal is, the more bankers want to walk away because people want safe, easy, reliable money. Right? Everybody wants safe, reliable money. And so having a essentially complex financial arrangement in order to have a mix of rental housing units and units for sale where the rental units have a variety of incomes, think about the complexity in lending for that. It is not easy. So you have to find developers who are willing to bang their heads against a wall to get lenders who are comfortable. Or the few projects where you do see this succeed is typically where you have a benefactor who wants to attach their name to being a great benefactor. And so there are certain instances where you can find this, um, but generally it's because the lending institutions get uncomfortable um, and they want to see a guarantee of a higher, sort of safer bet. Um, so again, like getting back to the regulatory environment in the Netherlands is a cocktail that's producing very sort of hybridized, complex systems that really create little villages Whereas in the United States, it's really independent. You've got this senior housing project, you get this low-income housing project, you get this high-end luxury uh, building, and they're all different typologies. You might have row homes over here, you might have towers over here. I mean, it's all sort of overlays with zoning, meets money, meets regulatory environment, uh, meets also public's uh, willingness to see experimentation with public dollars. And I think this is kind of one of the other ones is the cultural overlay here is uh, the term progressive uh, or the term experiment are scary words in the United States. Um, and not everywhere. Certain jurisdictions that's acceptable and in certain jurisdictions is frightening. And so I think, it, I think the environment of governments or local governments willing to take risks is a very much a part of the cocktail uh, that kind of produces this. And, and I think what you've laid out is the Netherlands have a high threshold for risk. Um, well, I think it's not so risky. Um, in the Netherlands, because the government um, <coughs> takes care of the infrastructure. So you, you're not expecting the, all their streets and everything to be done by developers. And then also the housing corporations have money to, they are, they're they using their own money. So they are in control. They are, don't have to go to someone else to finance it, although sometimes. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of building on that a little bit. I think outside of maybe Iowa and the Midwest, it's hard to build housing full stop. Any housing is difficult to build. I mean, I think as a result of that, if you're building housing in places like San Francisco or New York or places where it's just so hard to, to get approval for anything, the result of that is, in part, developers can spend a lot of time in the approval process. They're going to spend a lot of money in the approval process. And what gets built is, as a result, relatively safe, right? Like it's, there's, no kind of, there's no market for complexity because all the market is spent just getting anything approved. Um, and so when you have kind of situations like where you have sort of density that already exists in a place like the Netherlands and kind of housing development, dense housing development is just sort of understood as the way in which you develop housing. It makes it a lot easier than when in the US you just, anything, kind of being built anything above two stories is a battle.
And, and I think to that end, I, I, this isn't all doom and gloom, uh, at least from my point of view. I think, I think there are some active hot spots around the country who are actively trying to, and I'm talking about the United States, who are actively trying to figure out how do we make room for um, more innovative solutions. So the term micro housing is showing up because that kind of fits within the context of litigation, regulation, uh, and by creating a new sort of option, it, it allows a new market to emerge. Um, so New York has some very interesting sort of reactions. San Francisco, which is a, which is a very tough market, um, people are getting priced out very quickly. Same thing with Seattle. These markets are being forced to generate new answers, um, and so I think in these sort of extremes, you'll find uh, that the regulatory process is trying to incentivize developers to include new answers or more complex answers. Um, whereas in a place, again, I'll use Des Moines or even Ames, um, those processes are, are typically much simpler. Um, and so, again, the econ when, the, when the processes are so simple, economy wins the day. Uh, speed, delivery, cost, um, you know, playing it safe, getting the next project, getting the next project. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to continue the, uh, continue the discussion of the exhibition. I'm really happy with the points that you raised. And the, the thing I want to say is that working in Canada uh, with the architecture firm that I was with, one of the things I realized is that um, we as architects have all kinds of interesting design things that we learn to do in school. And then when you start working, you realize you can't do these interesting design things unless you can understand the developer's language and you can understand the business models. And that the more insight you have into that world, the more power you have to be able to say, hey, wait a minute, no, I have a solution for that issue you thought around financing because of these up in this way, this is how it's going to work. Being able to speak to a developer and understand these pieces is hugely, hugely empowering. And it's how we were able to do projects in Winnipeg that otherwise would be the thought we built. And I think that the work you're doing right now is that you're trying to figure out other ways. You're sort of in that right. world between architecture and design, right. and this is something we can be striving for. Mountain to climb. It's mountain to climb. It's something you should all, you know, be, become, as you become more skilled designers, and that becomes less intimidating, this is a whole new world to enter into to better understand. So, so one last comment, I think our, our friends in community regional planning, and I'm serious, the, these people yeah. are your allies. Yeah. The more you understand the process, and this is for any architect, landscape architect, any design professional, the more you understand the process by, bit, by which decisions are made, the better you know how to move your ideas for your clients to reality. So don't think of it as an adversary. Think of it as somebody who can assist you in building up a game plan on how to move through uh, the process of imagination to end, end uh, sort of experience. James, that's such a nice segue for me to do one final pitch for the Master's of Design program. Because it's interdisciplinary, right? We have planners, we have uh, architects, and we have landscape architects all teaching together. And that will sort of help you understand this world that you might be navigating. With that, I want to thank Julia, and thank the panel, and thank all of you for